and welcome to Accessible Attractions Worldwide. Carrie Corcoran here and we're going to do a vlog on Bronx Zoo which is 265 acres of parkland and home to more than 4,000 animals. It was um, absolutely amazing. The things and attractions that are there are seasonal so zoo is uh, very accessible to wheelchairs. There are some rough terrains um, and there are some different things, but um, a lot of it is accessible. Um, all the buildings are accessible to wheelchairs. A um, little bit of pricing. They've got about eight different premium attractions. So they cost about $6 each. So my advice would be, if you actually buy the ticket, you can get it cheaper on, on the internet that includes all those. It's ultimate access. Um, you get all those exhibits and premium activities free. Um, if you do five out of the eight attractions, it's £30. You can get a ticket online for twenty nine ninety five. So, I mean, you've paid for all the attractions you want to do and it's more or less free entry to the zoo. Um, we're going to show you the World Asian Monorail. Now, I had a manual wheelchair when I went and it was 26, under 26 inches wide. And to be able to get onto the monorail and most of the attractions, it's got to be under 26 inches wide for your wheelchair. But um, they do have smaller wheelchairs that you can transfer it onto to go onto the monorail. Um, I would definitely go on the zoo shuttle. The zoo t shuttle takes you all the way around. So if you want to go from one end of the zoo to the other end of the zoo, you can get on the uh, zoo shuttle and it take take you there. Um, like I say, that is accessible with a ramp uh, they pull down and they push you on. So um, that's really good to get around because it is a long way and you can just enjoy make the most of the day enjoy the rest of it the rest of the day there um we've got the video of the world asian mon monorail it um it takes you through um big wooded area um it's got elephants rhinos tiger that we didn't quite spot i don't think um but it was uh, really enjoyable. Do, <laughs> it was lovely to have it get on the monorail. You just roll on and roll off. Um, it, it was really good. Um, you get a carriage to yourself if you've got a wheelchair. The other premium things are you get um, into Jungle World. You get onto the Congo Gorilla Forest. Seasonal most of these are. You get the Butterfly Garden attraction. You also have the bug carousel and then there's two uh, more for child friendly things which is the children's zoo which is petting zoos with smaller animals and you've also got the nature trek where they can children they do the heck they can climb and things but they do have an actual wheelchair um, accessible route round there and they can also play um a uh, place to play um, at the table and things and I think wall art or, or different things so you know if you're doing all eight things it just makes sense to get the um, the ticket with everything included um, like I say you, you could get in on a Wednesday for free but then if you're going to pay for all the things you you might as well go when it's not so bit busy and go and see all the attractions and if you're only going once enjoy the whole zoo um we've got a little clip at the end of the sea lion pool which was lovely um and like i say it's accessible all the way around all the buildings are accessible cafes accessible you can take your own food in i mean most places if you're diabetic or you have a special diet will let you take things in anyway but just families can take in picnics and things as well so 
um, really nice time. Uh, it's definitely well worth. We had a lovely full day's activity there. As I say, it's really long to walk round, so I would uh, use the zoo, zoo sh shuttle and um, make sure you have a, a little stops and rests as you walk round as well. Um, but yeah, it was absolutely fabulous. So the first, the first thing I'm going to show you is the Asian monorail. Here's the film. Cart. Now that also includes small children sitting on laps. Let's begin our journey. Now guys, Asia is the continent with the largest deer species. And it is well known for its deer diversity. As we come into the meadow, look towards the left. And you can actually see a whole bunch of our honey-colored deer, which are all the way towards the very top of that little hill on the left. Those are our Barashiga deer. Now the black folk antelope, males and females, are actually sexually dimorphic, meaning that they look very different from one another. The males have horns on them. Now here we also get to see a lot of our peacocks, as you guys noticed. We have them all over the zoo as well, here on the monorail. Now those are India's national birds, the peacocks. And that sound you hear right now is their mating call. So the males actually have those beautiful feathers on them, as I'm sure you all have seen before. Whereas our females actually do not have them at all. And that small little tiny brown fellow we got a spot towards the right hand side. He tries to hide away from us. There's actually two more in the shed towards the left. They're currently hiding. But here we get to see one of our Indian mudjack deer. Now the Indian mudjack deer is also called the barking deer for many reasons. They actually like to bark during their mating time, so that's how we that's how they get their name. And also, they have a one-inch canine teeth, which they use in order to bite off their rivals. So they're just a little bit feisty. Now, we'll be able to spot some more uh, of our deer once we round the corner and make our way towards the far backhand side of that meadow. Now, guys, we all know that an animal that is extinct no longer exists, like the dinosaurs or the dodo. Now, in this next exhibit, we're going to be spotting our Mongolian wild horses. And as soon as you guys come in, look straight towards the far back right hand side and you'll be able to spot them all. They're currently right underneath these trees that we'll see here in a moment. So once again, these are all of our Mongolian wild horses. Now the Mongolian wild horses were actually extinct in nature and can only be spotted in zoos. Recently, they have been reintroduced in several areas of Mongolia and China, stretching from herds in North America and Asian zoos as well. Now if you guys take a good look at our horses, you might spot some differences between these fellas and the domesticated ones. Now some of those differences include, they have a stockier build, shorter legs, and an erect mane, which is also missing the forelock. Now that is a piece of the hair that falls over their forehead. Usually in the morning, our horses love to travel right on top of this little hill here. You guys will be able to spot a moment. Our zookeepers love to provide lots of hay and vegetables as well. So we might be able to see a little bit of hay residue here and there. And they use it to their advantage. They sometimes roam around towards the very top, sometimes towards the bottom. And the zoo actually received its first set of animals in 1902. To this day, we have had over 50 Mongolian wild horses and they have all been born here at the Bronx Zoo. Now I'm sure you guys might be wondering where are all the other horses, since 50 of them were born here at the zoo. Well, most of them have actually been sent over to sanctuaries where they have an even bigger space to roam around and live their life happily and freely. Now next we're going to be on the lookout for two of our vulnerable endangered species. We're going to be taking a good look and see if we can spot some of our gower, which are these big brown animals with massive horns, and also our brow and their deer. Now keep on looking straight towards the very top of the hill. To the right hand side you'll be able to see them. So once again the ones with the very dark brown color to them and massive horns is the gower. Now we're going to be able to see them a little better. Once we follow this tree here and look right towards the back of it, so 
you'll be able to see this fallen tree look right behind it and you'll be spotting the gower once again those big brown animals towards the far back now the gower can actually stand at six feet tall and ten feet long males can actually weigh as much as two thousand pounds just as much as a small car now the gower with their large thighs and impressive horns can actually fight off just about anything, even a tiger. But what threatens these huge animals is the loss of their habitat and diseases they can also catch from domestic cattle. Now, if you happen to take a good look at their horns, the ones that curve inwards is our female, and the ones that curve outwards is our male. So that's how we can tell the difference between them from afar. There's obviously a couple more differences as well. That is, if you look a little closer, now let's say we spot some of the brow elder deer. There might be some very close towards the fence there. It's a little hard to spot right now, but we might be able to spot them a little bit better once we round the corner and make our way towards the back. There's going to be this little bush in the way. So let's see. We're going to follow him down to the right hand side, okay? So for those of you in the back, look straight towards the very top of the hill, okay? There's going to be this bush, and next to it is going to be this fallen tree. He's actually right behind it right now. And that is Anakin once again, our male Siberian tiger. Now adult tigers are solitary animals and they actually tend to live alone in the wild. Which is why we're only able to see one in the exhibit at a time. Now he's walking down that path again, so keep an eye on him, okay guys? To the left he's going to be walking now. Now tigers hunt a variety of animals, but prefer wild pigs and medium-sized deer. Now typically a tiger will gorge itself on a fresh kill, eating as much as 40 pounds of meat at one time. Now just think guys, that's actually about 160 hamburgers in just one sitting. So after a meal of that size, a tiger will usually not eat again for several days. Those are our axis deer, and we have a couple of them alongside the fences here as well. Now the axis deer actually keeps its spots for the rest of its life. Unlike other deer, once they mature, they actually lose them. But our axis deer keeps them forever. And right alongside the bloody road here, we get to see another one of our black book antelope currently laid down right now. Enjoy the mud and the sun, as you guys can see. We saw a couple of them earlier in the very first meadow. Now they're super active, they love to run around very quickly. Now in this next little tiny enclosure we are about to spot our pig the Babarusa. So we're going to be looking straight towards the bottom of the right here. Soon as we pass the bamboo, look straight alongside the fences here. And our first one we're going to spot is our male. So see if we spot him straight towards the bottom of the fence here. So we spell Babarusa. Now our female is also very close towards the fence usually, but she is straight towards the very bottom of the fence. You can kind of see her. They blended super well, guys. And that was our female Babarusa. Now the word Babarusa means pig deer in the Malay language. Male Babarusa use their tusks to fight other males. Well, we're going to be spotting our Asian elephant, Patty. And she's right here in front of us, giving us a great look at her. So for those of you in the back, give it a second. We're slowly but surely going to be approaching her. And this is Patty once again, our Asian elephant. Now an Asian elephant can actually weigh as much as 10,000 pounds. So they need to eat a lot of vegetation. Our elephants here at the Bronx Zoo can actually eat as much as 200 pounds of hay each day and drink about 60 gallons of water. Now there are about more than 40,000 muscles in an elephant's trunk and it's actually a pretty incredible tool which they use to pick up grass from the ground and even hay to feed themselves. And we're going to be on the lookout for another large babble. Now she's also going to be at a great spot for us to see. As we come in we're going to take a good look towards the very bottom of the left here right alongside the fence. We're seeing Callie our Indian rhino. Hello, Pally. She's currently loving the mud right now. Yes. Her lifting up her ears. So once again, this is Pally, our Indian rhino. As you guys come in, for those of you in the back, look straight towards the bottom of the left, okay? She's very close towards the fence. 
Maybe she'll move. Maybe she won't. <laughs> She's currently just sitting there. So she's relaxing right now. Usually during this time she likes to be in the mud wallow, which we see one right there in the center, bathing herself in mud. Now today we know that all rhinos are highly endangered. Less than 2,000 Indian rhinos survive in India and Nepal. 16 months. Now many people also describe rhinos as armor plated, but they're actually covered with a layer of skin that has many folds. Now, though the skin of a rhino looks thick and tough, it is actually very, very sensitive and needs protection from the sun and insects. One of the rhino's favorite ways to protect its skin is to lay in a mud wallow, which we're seeing her second one here in front of us. Now, usually she comes towards this mud wallow at the end of the day, spends a couple of hours laying there as well. Now, since Walls Asia opened in 1977, many rhinos have spent time enlarging in that mud wallow. Now, by stomping around in the mud, a rhino can actually shape and mold the area into their personal liking. Now, as we leave Kali behind, we're going to be on the lookout for a couple more of our deer and also an antelope. As soon as we pass by all these beautiful trees we see here, we're going to be taking a good look into their exhibit and see which one we spot first. Now, our largest deer can stand at 5 feet tall and weigh about 650 pounds. We can see a couple of them right through the trees here. And our smallest deer weighs less than 40 pounds. The weather makes it sound very similar to the bark of a dog. Now take a good look alongside a circular fence here. That small little fella is our Fabosa Sika deer. Now the Fabosa Sika deer actually has a couple spots on him right now. But during the winter time they become less prominent due to the thickening of their coats. So they actually lose their spots in the winter time. And if you look right towards the bottom here, this is another one of our Indian mudjack deer, which we previously saw. So we have one of them here in this exhibit. We're gonna be circling around, and if you guys look alongside the fence there, you can actually see one more of our sandbar deer, which is actually the one that stands at five feet tall and weighs about 650 pounds. We're gonna see a couple more once we round this corner here. They have all traveled towards the right-hand side for us to see. Now once we pass by this rocky hill we're seeing here, we're going to look straight towards the back of it. And we'll be able to see a couple more of our deer. Now once we get towards this side, you guys might notice that some of our trees are fenced in just a little bit. And that is actually to protect our trees. Sometimes our animals like to use their antlers and carve off the bark of the tree. And if all the bark is carved off, a tree can actually die. We know that trees provide excellent resources for our animals, including food as well as shade. So we fence them off just a little bit to protect them, while also keeping this beautiful environment for our animals. Now here we can see a whole bunch of our guy antelope. These are the lighter fellas right in the center here. Now the word guy means blue bull in Hindi, and they actually love to eat lots of leaves, flowers, and even fruits from trees as well. Now towards the very top, we can actually see a couple of the little tiny ones, which are our hog deer. And the hog deer tends to creep low and run low just like a hog. So they act very similar to it, so that's how they get their name. Let's see if we are in luck here and can spot one of our Chinese tufted deer. I see a couple of them to the top of the right here. Now keep looking straight towards the very top of the right. You'll see those little tiny fellas. Those are actually full grown size Chinese tough and deer guys. Now they weigh less than 40 pounds, but they make the sound very similar to the bark of a dog. And these fellows actually prefer the cool weather rather than warm weather. So many times in the spring and summer, we rarely get to see them. And just like the white tailed deer here in New York, the Chinese tufted deer also has a white tail rough on it. And these little fellows are also super rare outside of zoos in China. And there's currently a couple of our bark horns straight towards the bottom as well. And if you guys happen to notice the really, really tiny ones, those are some of our baby goats we actually had last season. And they have grown since then, so they look a little bit bigger now. And they're also growing in their horns. You guys might notice that as well. Look all the way towards the right-hand side, and we can actually see another one of our bark horn, once again with the very, very spirally horns. Now, the bark horn has been known to climb trees, in order to reach fresh leaves and fruits. 
Our Himalayan tar is the ones with the very small horns. And they're actually a relative to the wild goat. The tarps hoops have special rubbery cores that help them grip the rocks much like the sole of a boot. And as you guys can see, these fellows are excellent rock climbers and tree climbers as well. I've seen it before. It is very impressive. Now, if you guys wanted to study them in the wild, you have to be ready to do some serious rock climbing because they are pretty good at it. Now, many people have been fascinated by this next little furry animal, so make sure you guys don't miss him. Here's our red panda, Linus. So look right behind this V-shaped tree. Right behind it, in this small little tree, taking his daily nap, is Linus, our red panda. Now, for those of you in the back, don't worry. You guys will be able to spot him very well, just a moment. We're slowing it down so you all can see him, okay? So he's going to be towards the right hand side, look past that V shaped tree, on top of the small tree right behind it is Linus. Once again, our red panda. Now in Nepal, the red panda is called Hun Ho, which roughly translates to firebox. We actually know that the red panda is more closely related to skunks, weasels, and raccoons. They're actually not as related to the giant panda as we thought they were, although they do both eat bamboo. Now if you guys want to see some more of our red pandas, make sure to head on over to the Himalayan Highlands exhibit so you guys can also see our big cat, the snow leopard as well. Almost at its end. Now this would be the perfect time to collect all of your belongings and make sure that nothing is left behind. Remember guys that the Bronx Zoo is part of the Wildlife Conservation Society and in addition to managing five parks here in New York City, the Bronx Zoo, the New York Aquarium, Central Park Zoo, Queen's Zoo and Prospect Park Zoo, the Wildlife Conservation Society also has scientists in the fields at more than 300 sites in over 60 countries. Now in just a moment, we're going to be taking a quick stop before we enter the platform just to reset the train. And then shortly after, we'll be moving along and ending our journey here. Now once again, guys, if you want to take a good look at some more of our tigers, head on over to Tiger Mountain, a short walk from the monorail. And if you guys want to continue to see some more cool, interesting Asian animals here at the World of Asia. And we've also got a very small clip of the sea lion pool with the sea lions playing. Uh, really enjoyable chilling out watching them. Everything was filmed from the wheelchair. Um, so you could see that it was great views all the way around. <laughs> Thank you for watching. We'll see you again. Take care for now. Bye. And roll those credits.